Who am I? None of your business. Hearing this line strikes fear into the heart of many old school Hearthstone players, triggering a kind of response that only Secret Paladin could. The deck was unique in that it existed in a time before massive synergy cards were commonplace. Curvestone was the mode of play at the time. Simply playing decent cards on curve was the prevailing strategy for most decks, and Secret Paladin was a deck along these lines. However, it had one aspect which other decks at the time did not. In order to understand how Secret Paladin got to be such an influential deck, we must go back to the origins of the class in Classic. The nature of secrets dictates that they must all cost the same within a class. Otherwise, when a secret is played, you'd be able to narrow down the possibilities as to which secret it was based on the cost, which would obviously defeat the purpose of the card being a secret. Paladin drew the short straw of the original three secret classes, and ended up with their secrets costing one mana. With one mana being the lowest possible cost for a card other than zero, which wasn't used very much at the time, there wasn't very much space for what the cards could do, and they ended up not very powerful on average as a result. From the original four Paladin secrets, Noble Sacrifice was probably the strongest. Diverting an attack from a key target to a smaller 2-1 body was a pretty powerful effect for one mana, and the card would see inclusion in some Paladin lists on its own merit. The other cards had much more limited success. Their effects weren't particularly powerful, and even in the early days of Hearthstone, cards like Eye for an Eye simply don't do enough to warrant a place in most Paladin decks. Hearthstone's first expansion, Nax Ramus, would introduce Avenge, which would turn out to be a particularly powerful secret, and would see inclusion in many Paladin decks. The cards synergized particularly well with Paladin's hero power, which facilitated growing a wide board presence in order to make the best use of the secret's effect. Further to this, Avenge also synergized particularly well with Noble Sacrifice, as the death of the 2-1 Defender would trigger the Avenge effect on the minion which had been defended. These two secrets became pretty much synonymous with Paladin's identity as a class, so much so that when a secret was played by a Paladin, it was almost certain to be one of these two, somewhat eliminating the secret nature of playing a secret card. The Grand Tournament saw the release of another secret, Competitive Spirit, which also played into Paladin's ability to easily grow a wide board by buffing all of your minions with plus one plus one at the start of your next turn. This card was widely considered to be good in the build-up to the expansion, and it was thought that it would be included in most Paladin decks once it was released. These predictions ended up being right, but not in the way that most content creators were expecting. They were, all of them, deceived, for one more card was printed. One card to rule them all. Who am I? None of your business. Mysterious Challenger was a type of card that had never been seen before in Hearthstone. It allowed for the playing of many cards straight from the deck into the battlefield, and for this reason its power went mostly undetected during the build-up to the release of the Grand Tournament. Many content creators predicted that the card would see little play. A 6-6 six, six for 6 mana was alright stat-wise at the time, but the battle cry would have had to have a major upside to justify including it over other options at that mana cost. The reasoning followed that as most of the Paladin secrets were pretty bad, a card which played them for free was not actually generating that much value. Furthermore, in order to play set secrets, you would have had to include them in your deck, which would massively reduce the amount of other good cards that could be included due to the deck size limit. Soon after, the Grand Tournament was released, and unfortunately the prevailing sentiment surrounding Mysterious Challenger had been wrong. It turns out that playing a 6-6 body and 5 secrets was very powerful, even if the secrets were only costed at one mana. Previous to this, little thought had been given as to how the individual secrets interacted when played together, as most of them saw very little play, and playing each of them individually for 5 mana would almost certainly not be worth the cost. However, now that they could all be played at the same time for free by Mysterious Challenger, the power became evident. Whatever was on your board at the time Mysterious Challenger was played became extremely difficult to remove. Using a spell to remove a minion would trigger Redemption. Using a minion to attack into anything would trigger Noble Sacrifice followed by Avenge. Playing a big taunt minion to try and weather the incoming storm would see that minion reduced to one health by Repentance. Anything that wasn't removed would then be buffed by Competitive Spirit the following turn. There just wasn't a winning play against the combination of triggering all of the secrets together. 
Further to this, the playing of the secrets straight from the deck turned out to be an unexpected advantage. Removing the secrets from your deck made your later draws more consistently high value, as many of the bad draws had already been removed by Mysterious Challenger. This was the first instance that I can remember of a major deck thinning effect in Hearthstone. Tracking and Mad Scientist had been around for a while, but this was on a completely different scale. There was also the fundamental difference in the quality of cards that were removed. Tracking would remove cards from your deck randomly, and you only got to keep one, whereas Mysterious Challenger would remove only your worst draws from your deck and put them into play. The deck also had an exceptionally strong curve, with the Secret Keeper on 1, Shielded Minibot on 2, Muster for Battle on 3, Partridge Shredder on 4, Sludge Belcher on 5, Mysterious Challenger on 6, and Doctor Boom on 7. All of these cards were well above average in terms of power level for that mana cost, and enabled the deck to usually do something that was at least good on every turn. Back in the early days of Hearthstone, this was usually enough to win games on its own, never mind the additional power provided by the Mysterious Challenger swing turn. The deck would absolutely dominate the meta throughout the Grand Tournament and interleague of Explorers, where the new card Sacred Trial was sometimes included alongside the already existing package of secrets. The release of Whispers of the Old Gods in 2016 saw the split between Standard and Wild take place, and moving to Wild were many of the signature cards for Secret Paladin, including Avenge, Shielded Minibot, Muster for Battle, and Sludge Belcher. This would massively reduce the power level of the deck in Standard, but it would continue to pop up here and there until Mysterious Challenger itself was removed from Standard following the release of Journey to Angoro at the start of the next year. In Wild, the deck had remained relevant throughout the Year of the Kraken, but by the start of the Year of the Mammoth, it was showing its age. Other classes had received strong synergy cards, which promoted playstyles beyond just Curve Stone, and gradually, Secret Paladin was crowded out of the meta. The deck saw some resurgence with the release of Kobolds and Catacombs, particularly bolstered by the card Call to Arms, which shored up the deck's now flagging early mid-game, and set up a board which could then be defended by a follow-up Mysterious Challenger. However, when Call to Arms was targeted for a nerf during the Witchwood, the writing was already on the wall for Secret Paladin. Even an odd Paladin were simply better decks, even in Wild. The deck would see some experimentation here or there, but it never regained the place in the meta that it had in those early years. It was time for a new King of Secrets to be crowned. It was time for a new deck to spring up and take the place of Secret Paladin. Mage was a class whose secret synergies had been gathering steam over time. As mage secrets cost 3 mana, they usually had much larger effects than those of their paladin counterparts. Cards like Ice Block, Counterspell, Ice Barrier, and to a lesser extent Mirror Entity, had all seen inclusion in mage lists on their own merit, with little synergy to speak of. Max Ramus printed Mad Scientist Duplicate, the form of which allowed for the cheating out of a 3 mana secret in mage. This was usually very impactful, and saw play in many mage decks just for the value that it provided. The secrets previously mentioned were going to be included anyway, so why not include Mad Scientist and get one out for free? Duplicate saw some niche play here and there, but generally the older secrets were simply better, and therefore more favoured. Beyond Nax Ramus, secrets saw little development for mage. Effigy was printed as part of the Grand Tournament and saw little play. Beyond that, the archetype would see no development until One Night in Karazhan a whole year later. One Night in Karazhan introduced Medivh's Valet, a card which dealt 3 damage to a target if you controlled a secret. This card was certainly good, and filled the hole left by Mad Scientist's exit from Standard. The secrets it required were being included anyway, so it seemed like an obvious choice for most decks. Ice Block was also very difficult to trigger, requiring the mage player to take lethal damage, which ensured that the mage would almost always have a secret up to take advantage of Valet's conditional effect. Main Streets of Gadgetsan would arrive later that year and see the introduction of some secret synergy cards, Cabal Lackey and Cabal Crystal Runner, both of which were very good if you were running a deck with multiple secrets. I think at this point it was fair to say that a secret package was forming for mage. These cards, alongside the already existing secrets and secret synergy cards in Mage, would often be included together in tempo decks, which aimed to always have a good play on every turn and burn down the opponent relatively quickly. Journey to Ongoro introduced Mana Bind, 
which saw occasional play in standard, but was hampered by an overlap of trigger conditions with counterspell. To trigger a counterspell, opponents would usually want to play a low mana spell, and if this set off mana bind, it would end up not generating as much value as perhaps the mage player would have wanted. The other notable card included was Arcanologist, a reasonably statted 2-drop, which would also draw a secret from your deck. This card synergized particularly well with Cabal Lackey and the existing secret synergy cards, as it ensured that you had a secret in hand more often to trigger the beneficial effect of Cabal Lackey and Kirin Tor Mage, both of which were seeing inclusion in the secret package at this point. Knights of the Frozen Throne saw little development for the secret playstyle. Frozen Clone was printed, but the card ended up seeing very little play as it was easy for an opponent to prop the effect with a small minion, rendering the three mana spent pretty much wasted. This brings us back to Kobolds and Catacombs, which would be the start of the turning point from a secret package into a fully fledged secret deck. Two key cards were printed in Kobolds and Catacombs, Explosive Runes and Aloneth. Explosive Runes gave reach to aggressive secret based decks, as opponents playing low health minions would not only have their minions removed, but they would also take considerable damage for having played them. This aggressive secret archetype had plenty of secret draw cards, secret discount cards, and burn cards, but what it did not have was efficient card draw. Aluneth was just the card that this deck needed to support its game plan of simply playing everything as quickly as possible and burning the opponent down. The deck was nowhere near as oppressive as Secret Paladin at its peak, but a secret-based mage deck had certainly started to take form. The following expansion, The Witchwood, saw One Night in Karazhan and Main Streets of Gadgetsan rotate out of Standard, and with them, the key cards of the Secret Mage archetype. In Standard, Secrets would go back to just being a package, mainly supported by Archonologist, but in Wild, Secret Mage continued to see play as it had during Kobolds and Catacombs. From here on, Secret support for Mage in Standard would come in waves, with none of the set's support ever coalescing to bring a real Secret Mage deck back to life in Standard. But for Wild, the story was only just beginning. The Boomsday Project saw Stargazer Luna printed which would function as an additional card draw engine for Secret Mage in Wild. A good card to be sure, but the archetype would receive little support over the course of the Year of the Raven, with no notable cards being printed for the archetype in Rastakhan's Rumble. The Year of the Dragon would roll around, and Rise of Shadows would again bring nothing of note for the Secret Mage archetype. At this point, the archetype was just about hanging on, but was beginning to be pushed out of the Wild meta. Little did we know, this was just the quiet before the storm. Saviors of Uldoom saw four very strong support cards printed for Secret Mage. Ancient Mysteries, Arcane Flak Mage, Flame Ward, and Cloud Prince. These cards saw some experimentation in Standard, and even ended up included in some lists, but their real impact was on Wild. Ancient Mysteries allowed a Mage Secret to effectively be played for two mana instead of three. A decent effect, but nothing special. That is, until it's combined with Arcane Flak Mage. Flak Mage deals 2 damage to all enemy minions when the mage plays a secret. As the reduction to 0 cost from Ancient Mysteries was permanent, you could play Ancient Mysteries on turn 2, and then hold on to the 0 mana secret until you wanted to clear a board with Flak Mage, then effectively play Flak Mage as a 2 mana 3-2 with Battlecry deal 2 damage to all enemy minions, which is undoubtedly a very strong card. This could also synergize with other secret reduction cards which Secret Mage already had, such as Cabal Lackey, meaning playing Flak Mage and two secrets on one turn wasn't even unreasonable. This, alongside the new secret Flame Ward, gave Secret Mage access to one of the few things that it had previously lacked, a reliable board clear. The very aggressive decks that would previously outpace it, such as Odd Paladin, could now have their wide boards countered much more easily by Secret Mage, which left the deck with very few meaningful weaknesses. The final card from Saviors of Uldoom was Cloud Prince. This was obviously an auto-include. Fireball with a 4-4 body for only one extra mana? Sounds great! This card allowed the mage to both burn down their opponent and put a decent minion on the board on turn 5, or, in a dire situation, the battlecry effect could even be targeted on a particularly threatening enemy minion. 
This card was very versatile, and the condition of controlling a secret was pretty much always met due to the amount of secrets that the deck was running at this point. Usually two copies of Counterspell, Flame Ward, Explosive Runes and Duplicate, often with a single ice block for a total of 8 or 9 secrets. The combination of all of these cards pushed the deck from struggling to meta-defining in Wild over the course of just one expansion. Secret Mage was certainly the up-and-coming deck to beat, and it has held that spot of relevance in the Wild meta ever since. Descent of Dragons gave nothing of note for Secret Mage, however the following expansion, Ashes of Outland, gave yet more secret support in the form of Apexis Smuggler and Netherwind Portal. Apex's Smuggler looked promising, and we'll be talking about a standard deck it probably would have been good enough to see play. But in Wild, the competition for the 2-drop slot was just too high, with Ancient Mysteries, Archaeologist, and Mad Scientist all occupying that space. The effect of discovering a spell after playing a secret did not immediately advance the Secret Mage game plan, so it was deemed to be just too slow. Ashes of Outland also introduced Netherwind Portal. Yet another powerful secret, which immediately advanced the board state when triggered. As mentioned previously, there were already 8 or 9 secrets in the deck at this point. Adding any more would upset the balance of secrets to secret synergy cards, and so it is at this point that most players began swapping secrets out. The most common substitution was to remove the two duplicates in favour of two Netherwind portals, as the minion generated by Netherwind portal was usually better than duplicating something like a Cabal Lackey. Skolomance Academy once again skipped secret support for Mage, but the follow-up expansion would come back with some even stronger inclusions. Madness at the Dark Moon Fair introduced one new secret, Brigged Fair Game a card which would allow the mage to draw three cards if they had not taken damage during their previous turn. This finally completed the full range of secret triggers for mage. Play a spell, punished by counterspell. Play a minion, punished by explosive runes. Damage the mage, punished by flame ward. Don't damage the mage, punished by rigged fair game. This new secret was quite divisive, as it gave the deck access to early game card draw, shoring up what had arguably been one of the deck's few weaknesses. But the support didn't end there. Two further support cards were included in Madness at the Darkmoon Fair. Occult Conjurer and Sage, Seer of Darkmoon. Occult Conjurer was a 4-mana 4-4, which summoned a copy of itself if the mage controlled a secret, which, as we previously established, was a condition that was pretty much always fulfilled. The deck was so refined that before the expansion was released, there was even some debate as to whether or not the deck had room for a 4-mana 8-8. Let that sink in. There was serious consideration as to whether or not a 4-mana 8-8 was good enough to make the cut. Needless to say, when the card was released, space was made in the deck for it, usually by cutting down to only one copy of Netherwind Portal and one copy of Flame Ward. Two copies of Rigged Fair Game were also included by cutting one copy of Counterspell and Stargazer Luna, as the additional card draw was no longer needed. The final card of note from Madness at the Darkmoon Fair was Sage, Seer of Darkmoon, a 6 mana 5 5 with the battle cry Draw One Card, upgraded for each friendly secret that has triggered this game. This card would usually draw somewhere between 6 and 8 cards when played in the late mid-game, and would enable a full hand refill for the mage, so that the game could be closed out. The card was even good enough that the deck cut Aluneth in favour of it, and Aluneth was the card that had enabled the archetype to flourish in the first place. It was at this point, I think, where community sentiment really started to shift majorly against Secret Mage. It had been a good deck in Wild for quite some time already, and it seemed to be even further cementing its place in the Wild meta for some time yet to come. The actual effectiveness of the deck is often debated, with some players saying that it's perfectly fair and has counters, which undoubtedly it does, but with many arguing that the deck is simply not fun to play against, due to how little you can interact with its strategy. Blizzard has stated that there are currently no changes in the works for Secret Mage in Wild, so it seems that for now, the jury is still out on whether the deck is healthy for the wild metagame or not. Only time will tell which side of history Secret Mage will fall on. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Um, 
There'll be two standalone videos next week, one for Hunter and one for Rogue. I didn't forget about them, I just didn't feel like they fit into the narrative for this video, as this has mostly been a wild-focused video, and those two classes will mostly focus on standard. So I hope you enjoyed the video and look forward to those next week.